Hey y'all, what's up? My name is Jess. Welcome back to my garden here at Roots and Refuge Farm. Today is the second weekly garden tour of the 2020 gardening season. And we're really at that point of thoroughly transitioning into the warm weather crops. We still got late winter, early spring stuff in the garden, but some of that is starting to phase out and we're bringing in the warm weather stuff. This is a really exciting point in the gardening year for me because as I'm planting these tiny little tomato plants and sowing seeds for cucumbers and flowers and squash, I know that it's going to look like a jungle here in just a few short months. Uh, I will look back on this video and think, wow, look how bare it was. It's about to be really, really lush and beautiful and fruitful. So we're just on the brink of that and I'm excited to take you through the garden today and show you what's going on. Here in the front, I've planted my jasmine, which I intend to allow that to grow all the way down this fence. Uh, it's going to be a yellow flowering plant and uh, that was kind of my in memory of Kitten George plant because it would be beautiful and yellow and climb all over everything uh, down the edge of the garden. I wanted it right here by the front gate. The roses are looking as majestic as ever. Absolutely gorgeous. This week has been a little bit difficult because I've actually had some writing projects that I've been working on and it has been the struggle every day of whether I'm going to do what I actually need to do or come out and work in the garden because this is finally uh, the week that we're beyond any cool nights. I mean we're really into the spring season. We also had some really severe weather this week after I'd already planted two rows of our tomatoes. I stopped. Uh, we ended up having some hail and we had a little bit of damage in the garden. Not not too bad. Nothing was destroyed. Now it's it's really time. I can plant anything. I I promised I was going to wait until mid-May to plant my peppers and eggplant. So I'm getting really close to that. A lot of the plants are getting tired of being in the greenhouse but I've, I've had to be inside. It's really hard being a grown-up sometimes because you have to do the responsible thing. Now here on the arbor leading into the cottage garden, I have a couple of roses and these are different colors that they, they don't match. I'm so in love with this rose covered arbor with the tangerine skies arbor rose that I'm actually considering purchasing some more from that arbor rose line. Um, I found them at an online store called Jackson and Perkins. And I'm gonna decide tonight before I publish this video because if I link that website to you guys, I don't wanna risk them going out of stock. But I, I'm thinking that I might move these roses. I am on, it's a dangerous thing for this rose arbor to be as beautiful as it is because I am on a rose tangent. I want to put roses absolutely everywhere right now. And uh, so I don't know, I might end up buying some more and switching these out, planting some more. I'm considering putting some other places in the garden. And I'm not even gonna ask you to talk me down and tell me not to plant the roses because y'all, you guys will totally support me. You'll be like, plant all the roses, plant all the beautiful roses. Cause look at that. Is that not the most convincing thing to plant all the roses? I currently can't even remember what color these are. We'll know here shortly cause they're about to open up some blossoms. These were just the cheap little um, roses that come with the plastic wrapped around the roots. I mean, I want to say I pay like $7 each for these plants. This one's about to blossom as well, but they were just climbing roses. I thought they were pretty when I bought them, so. My limelight and hydrangeas here are looking really good. And a lot of the stuff that we've transplanted is really starting to kind of take root. This space really doesn't look like a lot yet, but things are just starting to poke out and look like something. My green stalks are now planted with bush beans. I did uh, purple burgundy bush beans in this one and Tanya's pink potted bush bean beans in the other one. And that was on your suggestion. I asked you guys for suggestions on what we should grow in these two green stalks. And I think the bush beans are gonna be really good in these. I think it's gonna be easy to pick them uh, upright like this. And just the size of those plants, I think it's gonna be absolutely wonderful in these. I'm, I'm really excited. They're not up yet, so soon. At this point, all of these guys are just waiting for me to be able to plant them in the greenhouse. 
some of these are going into the garden out here, but I've planted for the most part all the tomatoes that are going into this garden. So uh, the rest of these are for the greenhouse and then the peppers and stuff for this garden. These ladies are hard at work. Here's something very exciting that developed this week. We harvested the first strawberries that we've ever grown on our farm. Oh, that one's not quite ready yet. It feels slightly criminal to eat this even a little bit underripe because they are so life-changing when they're fully red. But unfortunately, uh, little buggies and stuff are getting to them as they get really on the like very ripe side. So these are the best strawberries I've ever had. They're so crazy good. Like, it's ridiculous. Actually, we came out when we first found that we had ripe strawberries and we ate them. Maya and I were here. We've had a few raspberries off of our small plants, uh, but we were realizing just how many berries we were going to have next year. And we were like, wow, this is going to be so crazy and so cool. I, it's one of those things, when it comes to the perennial stuff, it's hard to get that started because you know that you're not going to get a lot of harvest at first. But getting in like ever bearing strawberries, which they put off runners and so, you know, they continue to put off new plants so you'll keep getting berries. And like putting in berry bushes and asparagus and all of that, when I really consider how much it's gonna be worth it later, I do wish we had done it sooner because just eating these strawberries, I'm like, it would be really nice if we had established something and we could be getting these, you know, in larger quantities now. Such is life though, right? So here is the comfrey plant that's flowering, and here our baby asparagus patch is growing. You can see uh, asparagus is really neat. This is a really tiny one, but uh, these are the very first shoots, and this is like the first day or so that they come up out of the ground. That's how we usually eat them, and that's why you have to let your asparagus patch get really established before you start harvesting because right now if we harvested all these little guys uh, the plants probably wouldn't recover but shortly after coming up they just they fill out they open up and they look like this and over the course of the season and then over the course of the next couple years I'll leave this patch alone you don't harvest till the third year and these asparagus plants will be really tall they'll fill out they'll spread and by allowing them to grow and establish then in a few years we'll get a lot of the asparagus spears and we'll be able to harvest them for a while throughout the spring and then you let them continue to grow uh, so I'm really excited to get this established um, and the thought was because I don't know how long we're gonna stay at this property uh, I think it's gonna be for a little while longer but somebody is gonna get to eat a lot of asparagus out of this pat and uh, you know I think I think planting a legacy is worth it even if you aren't sure you're the one who's going to get to reap the harvest now here I've got some gladiolus bulbs coming up which I'm glad to see a gladiolus and throughout the rest of the beds there are just little things popping up here and there that I've planted I don't actually know how like wowing this is going to look like this year I just I don't know uh, how how much this stuff is gonna take off I bet it surprises me but I can imagine at this point I've gardened long enough to have the vision to imagine what it's gonna be like next year and next year it's gonna be amazing in the first bed here I've got a lot of carrots I don't know how much of a root I'm gonna get on these carrots this year it just depends on what the weather does over the next few weeks and then down this side um, over half of this 48 foot bed is onions and garlic. I was a little late getting the garlic put in. Ideally in my area you want to sow garlic in like the beginning of November and I didn't put this in until the beginning of January but I thought that it would be better to grow it late than not grow it at all. The onions however I put in just at the right time also around January maybe Maybe it was the beginning of February. And they're looking really good. I did sweet onions almost entirely, like Texas sweet onions and Walla Walla onions. That's really my favorite kind that I really like to use the most. And so that's what I decided that I wanted to grow. Right here on my first trellis in the bed, my noodle beans are coming up and looking really healthy and good. And I think probably the most changed thing in the garden this week are the sweet peas. These are just some sugar snap peas. We've been snacking on them and they are absolutely delicious and so prolific. As you can see, these plants are just covered in blooms. 
Now this is just called blue potted pea and it is really, really pretty. They're a little bit later than the others so it took a little longer to get going. So I haven't eaten any of these yet. This is like the biggest one. And I've done the purple sh magnolia sugar tendril pea before. And this is very similar to that but the pods I feel like are, are darker. And these are magnolia sugar tendril peas which are not purple. These are just the regular ones. Uh, down here and these are also taking a while to get going. Peas are kind of difficult for me and our conditions. Now I'm thinking maybe with a high tunnel I might be able to grow th some through the winter out there. I think that they would probably thrive in that case. They like cool weather and we just don't have a lot of the year that just stays consistently cool. Our winters get too cold for them and do kill them but the spring comes and can be so sporadic and just can get so warm very fast. So right now these taste amazing. I plant my peas out direct sown in the beginning of February here in 7b and they get to about this point by the beginning of May where we start picking a whole lot and we have about a three week window where we pick lots of delicious snap peas. I've never tried to do shelling peas just because peas are so difficult to grow here and the snap peas are so awesome and we just we eat them you can do them in stir fries or uh, we just eat them raw they get eaten so much out in the garden or take them in and eat them with some dips and stuff like that like on a tray before dinner they're so good but in a few weeks uh, the peas will start tasting kind of bitter as the days get really hot and they'll start really struggling and I'll tear them out and I will plant pole beans on this long wall here on the first row of the garden bed. Aren't these chives lovely? So this is the second year for these particular chives. This is two plants right next to each other and I mentioned in my video last week that these particular chives had overwintered with no cover and had come back and flowered this spring and looked amazing. I wasn't sure if that was because I have more mild winters but many of you up to zone three I think was the coldest place that said actually chives overwinter here too. So that's a really great thing to know. Uh, these are beautiful uh, just as an ornament in the garden but they're also great uh, for using in cooking as well. I'm planting some more chive plants over in the perennial garden just because I think that these blooms look like truffula trees and I need them in my life. Here next to these big cabbages are some little bitty okra plants and actually there are okra plants all down the side of this bed. Okra is very 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 prolific. It loves the heat. It grows really really quick. I was so surprised the first time I grew okra because I'd never grown it before. I'd never seen it grown before and when these plants were towering over me with okra growing all over them we call them the okra trees because they just get so massive. I just it, it completely surprised me. I don't know why and I love them in the garden. They're a relative of hibiscus and marshmallow and so they have a very hibiscus reminiscent blossom. It's very very beautiful. Okra blossoms are one of the prettiest blossoms uh, in a vegetable garden and their okra is very good for you. I have a video that like makes the case for okra. It's a southern food and so a lot of people have never tried it before and people either love it or they hate it but it, it's slimy. Um, it's The inside is just full of a substance called mucilage which is really good for your digestive tract. I am growing an entire row of okra in the back that I'm going to freeze and pickle but I couldn't not have okra up in the front garden even though I'm doing a lot back here. I did a whole row here of a variety called Texas Hill Country. It's one of my favorite varieties and I also have in the back Clemson Spineless as well as Burgundy and I have a new variety that I'm growing this year called Silver Queen which is a variety that I got from Haas Tools. So I just put six plants down this row. They're gonna get really big and the thing that I was thinking with that just from a garden design standpoint is all of these cabbages and stuff they're going to be harvested in a month and this bed is gonna be really empty. I've got beets up here in the front also gonna be harvested here in the next month or so. I didn't want this to just be completely empty and so putting these okras in in a month when I'm pulling those cabbages out the okras will probably be about this tall and then they will explode and they will really fill out this space and I'll be able to plant some other stuff in here and not have a big bare spot in my garden. Here are some more okra babies sitting over here on the table. I fed this kale today with fish emulsion 
trying to get it to, to grow a little bit faster. You can see there's some yellowing on the leaves, which is typically a sign of nitrogen deficiency, which doesn't surprise or alarm me. We didn't amend that bed before I planted that kale, so it, it's not a wonder at all that it is slow growing and deficient. So I just watered it with some diluted fish emulsion today, and I also have some blood meal that I may come and mix into this soil to give all of this kale a boost. Down here I have a bunch of kale that overwintered from last year. This was stuff that was planted last fall, grew over the winter, and bolted this spring. And you can see the flowers here, and then lower down, this is where there were flowers, and it has now grown its seed pods. Uh, these are edible, and they're tasty. And right now they're still immature, so basically these are gonna dry. Right now, if you'll look here, the inside of the seed pod, you can see that these seeds are still immature. This needs to dry and uh, these will harden up and then that's when you can save these seeds. People get really intimidated by saving seeds for vegetables namely that don't have obvious fruits, seed bearing structures on the plant. Things that you have to allow to bolt or go to seed in order to get the seeds. But don't be intimidated. Truly, the, the main thing with saving seeds for anything that's not fruit bearing is letting it live out its life cycle. And at some point, it's going to become pretty apparent to you where the seeds are on that plant. Just like how this developed these uh, seed pods and then giving it more time to continue to flower and then dry off. Sometimes plants will have flowers that get kind of like, almost like dandelions, like they get like a fuzzy something in the flowers and then the seeds are behind that. Sometimes they do seed pods. It's not, it's really not that difficult and you can figure it out. The main thing is giving the plant enough time to actually reach that point of its process. Oh, we're only on the second and third rows. <laughs> I'm gonna run out of light, I will. I've got some big beautiful sunflowers coming up in my corners, which is gonna be really awesome. I filled this out with some variegated nasturtiums. I was noticing the other day that my early wonder beets have some really lovely roots down there. You can see that. If you're trying to figure out when to harvest a root vegetable, um, you can always just push the soil back off its shoulders and get an idea of how big the thing actually is. Fed all of these greens as well today as I was watering the kale with that fish emulsion. I went ahead and put some over here. Uh, my Cure de Bue cabbages are starting to get little heads. That makes me so excited. Oh wow, look at that beautiful nasturtium. I'm pretty sure that's peach melba with variegated leaves and that pretty peachy flower. So I harvested a couple of kohlrabis and made a really yummy slaw, which was really good. I decided I am a fan of kohlrabi. It's really, it's very fresh. It's very uh, what you would expect out of something in the brassica family. It's just got that really uh, fresh, kind of slightly cabbagey taste, but it is a very, it is a different thing. It's something all of its own. And many of you suggested fermenting kind of like a kraut of shredded kohlrabi and that's what I'm planning to do. I've only got like seven or eight more here in the garden and that's what I'm planning to do with these. I'm planning to go ahead and let these grow a little bit more to get a little bit bigger and I'm going to uh, ferment them. In this bed I've got some dragon tongue bush beans coming up and looking nice and as well as noodle beans on this trellis. I haven't planted most of these uh, shorter beds yet. They're still for the most part empty. I did tuck a sunflower into each corner. That's something that I just like to do. I like big sunflowers growing up out of the corner of my beds. When I first started doing that, I was told not to, that it would cause problems, that apparently sunflowers are called bad companion plants for whatever reason. I don't remember what it was, but I, I don't know. Like a lot of the companion planting rules, I just like to break them. I just. I just do. It's so weird too. I'm such a rule follower. But I got so frustrated with so much contradictory information that seemed very gray to me, but it was being presented as if it were black and white. And it got to the point that I got so frustrated that I just decided I was going to do whatever the heck that I wanted. 
And I do understand why some companion planting information is given. Uh, some things they say don't plant these together because one thing may prefer very acidic soil whereas the other one doesn't. And I listen whenever there are clear reasons like that. Like if it says don't do this with this because of this reason. Somebody can tell me why then I'll be like okay that makes sense. But if it's just like some vague thing I'm just like well we're just gonna see what happens. And the sunflowers in the corners of the bed as far as I can tell have never caused a problem and they're absolutely beautiful and I've had peas grow up them and uh, I've not had a problem with them casting a bunch of shade just because I only plant one in the corner of some of my beds and just let them get really tall and to me it's such a striking thing in the garden uh, you could harvest the seeds you could grow a variety that does big seeds but usually the birds get to them before I do and I don't mind I really just grow them for the sake of the beauty and the bees love them so once I get to save some seeds from these things I'll go ahead and tear out all of that I'll leave the tail down on the end as long as it's growing but once we tear out all of these plants we will go ahead and top dress this bed with a nice thick layer of compost and get it ready for whatever's going to be in there next and that's what's going on over here this half of this bed has already been amended I've got some Parisian pickling cucumber seeds right here on this TP. I was recently asked about these trellises and these are just one third pieces of cattle panels. It's a cattle panel cut into thirds and then fastened at the top with zip ties and then just staked down into the bed like a teepee. This is really, really easy. I like to do some smaller cucumbers on these. Right here I have my cucamelons, my Mexican sour gherkins. They're looking a little puny from being transplanted, but they'll take off here before too long. I've got them on both sides. They will absolutely cover this thing. That's just a pretty little nasturtium plant right there and that little squirt of a guy is a basil that I transplanted yesterday. Now this whole side of this bed is, is going to have to have some extra compost added. The only thing that's here are these beets. Everything in this bed was struggling really bad because we didn't amend the soil. I didn't think it would make that big of a difference to not amend it after the end of last year, but apparently it did. And what happened is the radishes and the carrots, and I had some frilly kale in here, and the radishes and the carrots just started to go to seed in the heat and they hadn't developed any roots and I think that was kind of because they didn't have a lot of nutrition. And then the kale was just sort of struggling and I decided to go ahead and rip it all out to give these beets a chance. These are Kugel beets, I think is what they're called. I can't remember the name of these. I'll put it on the screen below because I have the bag inside. I, I really like beets. I'd really like to grow these and I think that just top dressing this and adding some compost around them and feeding them well with uh, just like a fish emulsion or blood meal or something like that I think that they'll really take off the thing is is that at this point I don't have enough time to sow beets from seeds without the flavor really lacking because they'll be grown in the heat I can grow them again this fall but these are already to this point I think I can pull them through maybe and that's why we went ahead and ripped everything out of this bed okay so I'm turning around here and looking at these these three beds on the other side of the pavilion now this is where I'm growing my tomatoes this year and I'm going to show you that but first if you look right here here's one of them you see this little bitty seedling here there's a couple right in here those are red Malabar spinach and red Malabar spinach is this really beautiful vining green uh, that will cover this trellis. It will be stunning. It's absolutely gorgeous. Now, it's not actually a true spinach. It's called red Malabar spinach, but it's not a true spinach. It is a heat-loving plant. It has almost a succulent nature to its leaves, um, and it's kind of like that texture of spinach times five. It's like much thicker than a spinach leaf. Um, it is really tasty. It's good sauteed. The reason for me growing Malabar spinach is that growing greens through the heat of our summer is very difficult. Uh, they just go straight to seed. They get really bitter. They taste, it's just not good. So lettuces really aren't an option for me in the summer. And Malabar spinach is a way to continue to have something like that through those hot months. It's really only just a handful of months period that I can't grow lettuce. I have lettuce right now, I have kale right now. From June to September, I won't have any of that stuff. Um, and then I can start growing salad greens again. I can grow microgreens inside my house. But as far as something growing out in the garden, Malabar spinach is 
the thing that I like to grow for that period. The little seedlings that are currently at the base of this trellis actually volunteered in the bed where my trellis with Malabar spinach was last year. Uh, we were out here, I was planting tomatoes day before yesterday and Sweet Maya was mulching and I was like, hold on a second. I looked over and there were about a hundred of those little seedlings coming up in the bed where that plant had dropped seeds. And so I just uh, dug some of them out and moved them over to this trellis where I wanted them to grow this year and uh, before we went ahead and, and cleaned out the rest of the bed and mulched over it. They've transplanted well, they're still alive, they're still looking good, they're a very forgiving plant. So this trellis is gonna be so pretty, covered in that, and we'll have greens to eat in the heat of the summer. Well, down here I have my row of little puny baby cherry tomatoes going all the way down here. So an unfortunate thing happened while we were planting these. Benjamin was helping me and um, I'm pretty sure some of the markers got buried in the deep hole with the tomato plant, which is fine. Once they set fruit and uh, ripen, I'll be able to tell you exactly what they are because I know what I started. I laid them out so they're not all mixed up. Like there are plants that there's like two or three of the same and they're right next to each other. So I, I'll be able to tell what it is, but some of them, I don't know right now exactly what that plant is. And that happened on all three tomato rows. I didn't realize that was going on until the end. I saw one, he was going behind me and helping fill the hole back in. And he was doing a really great job. And on some markers, he took them and stuck them in the soil, which was great. But some of them absolutely got buried. And that's okay, it happens uh, when Ben was two. I'll never forget this. I planted the entire row of tomatoes and at the end of the row, he handed me all the markers because I'd put them in and he was going behind me and taking them all out. And that year, I kind of knew what everything was, but it was I was still fairly new to growing a lot of varieties. And uh, that year was the year of mystery. <laughs> I can tell you some of the varieties, the ones that have markers, but some of them I don't really know. There's a yellow cherry, sweetie, gobstopper, purple bumblebee. These all look the same. I don't know why I'm showing them to you. Amy's apricot cherry, blue goldberry, yellow pear. I'm giving yellow pear a try again. I haven't grown it in the last few years because it split really bad on me, but so many people list it as one of their fav favorites that I planted one plant this year. Black cherry, that's another one that so many people rave about. Brad's Atomic Grape, I've got a few of these. These are Malia's absolute favorites. So I've got three for her. And Malia's tomatoes are right by the pavilion. Malia and Ben are my tomato lovers. And I've found if you have babies, your kids, they're not babies, they're five and almost 15. But if you have kids that show an interest in the garden, I found that letting them have favorites and giving those precedents and making a big deal about the fact that that's their favorite, it goes such a long way. I've been growing Brad's Atomic Grapes for, I guess, four years now. It was the first year I grew, it was the year it was on Baker Creek's catalog cover. So I guess that's been four years ago now. And Malia loved them so much that we now have Malia's Brad's Atomic Grapes. And a lot of times I'll go ahead and grow some extras that are mine because Malia takes her cherry tomatoes very seriously and she will keep these tomatoes, especially if I plant them in a prevalent place, she will keep them stripped, picked. She takes it very seriously and I love that. I totally love that. <laughs> Here's a tiny little puny uh, Berry's Crazy Cherry, which I apparently did not harden off well enough because it looks awful. It will pull through. A lot of times if you do not do the due diligence to harden your plants off well, you'll end up with like a lot of damaged leaves, but you can see here at the top that these new leaves are healthy. So this plant will pull through um, and it won't even look, uh, it won't look bad here in a few weeks. So I just kind of skipped the place where this <laughs> kale, which had volunteered is because it's so big and we're still harvesting regularly off of it. So I'm not gonna pull that out and skipped right past it and started planting tomatoes again. And here I've got a sweet 100 and this is a dark galaxy, which is actually not a cherry tomato, but it's kind of like a smaller snacker tomato. And I have a few holes here that I haven't planted. If you're a regular viewer of our vlog, you may remember where I kind of goof starting my seeds. All of these I started 
February 15th is whenever I start my seeds. I might have started them the week before that. And they look really small now because I plant them super deep. You're only seeing the top little bit of these plants. They were like, they were about 14 inches high whenever I planted them. Two thirds of the plant is underground. But when I was starting the seeds back in February, I just completely messed up. I was using a new light and a new mat and new soil and I didn't water them enough and I had a few trays dry up. And one of my favorite, favorite cherry tomatoes is one by Wild Boar Farms called blueberries. And I've got the blue gold berries growing, but I accidentally killed all the blueberries. And a friend of mine who's local started some and she had extras and I'm getting some from her. So I've got a few holes here that are reserved because I'm gonna put some more plants down there that I just don't have yet. Now here, most of these beds are not planted yet. I've got some zinnias coming up in the corner. Uh, Northern Lights mix is the mix of zinnias that's there. And on this, kakuzi squash, which they're just starting to come up. Some cucumbers and a nasturtium, which looks better than any of the other nasturtiums in my garden, and I don't know why. It is just really happy with being right here. Now, down here on the end of the garden, I have these square beds. On this end, I have banana trees, which they're coming back and looking nice. Uh, and the rest of them are mostly filled with weeds. This one is a bed of lilies, which is just kind of like a memorial bed. And I've been trying to decide what to put down on this side of the garden and I've got some great suggestions from you. I think I may have settled on it. I'm, I've been sleeping on it for the last couple of days because uh, it is extra, but I, I think I may put shrub roses down in these square beds, which uh, the reason why I would choose to do that right now to give up viable growing space that I could grow food in uh, is because we have so much more space in the back. I can only process so much food. Um, we are growing for ourselves. We are growing for some of our close family members and, and friends. We're considering those people. Uh, to, uh, so I, we're able to use a lot of food, but also we have so much space this year. And I have literally, my heart has been wooed by the roses in the front and I really just thought you know it'd be really pretty to have some big bushy shrub roses along the back side of the garden here. The other thing I was considering putting down here was like uh, ginger and some things uh, like that and if I put roses down here I'll just put the ginger in the greenhouse. A lot of my trellises do have little cucumbers and um, melons coming up on them. We're just not talking about those much right now because they just don't look like much. And here are the rows of slicer tomatoes. You can hardly see them. They're so tiny and puny looking, which is hilarious because they're going to be huge before too long. But I also kept in mind that I have space for quite a few more plants out in the back greenhouse. I'm, I will be growing more tomatoes in the greenhouse than I'm growing in this garden. And in this garden, I have three 48 foot rows, which are currently planted with, I didn't count, but it's somewhere in the ballpark of 75 to 80 plants in those three rows. Between 18 and 24 inches apart, I do prune them. I've got a video about that, I'll link it below. And then after planting everything, I come in and put a thick layer of straw mulch on. And you can see that that helps massively with the weeds. It helps to uh, keep the warmth in the soil at night and keep the coolness in the soil during the day. It just works as an insulator. All, all the rest of these beds are not planted, but I, we were weeding and weeding and weeding, and we just decided to go ahead and throw that mulch down. This row down on the end is going to be largely ground cherries down this row. Uh, as well as probably some eggplants or peppers. And then I've got, of course, the space on the other parts of these beds that are not planted with tomatoes or don't have trellises on them. If you have any suggestions of things that you would really like to see us grow in these spaces of these beds, I am all ears to hear those. If, if you haven't noticed me growing something, uh, keep in mind we do have a warm climate. So anything that is a cool, loving plant, like in the brassica family, things like cabbage and cauliflower, those are not summer crops for me. Uh, any root vegetables are not summer crops for me. So it's gotta be something that likes the heat, but I've got a lot of space in this garden that I need to fill. So please give me suggestions because I've got these big spaces and I'm planting them over the course of the next two weeks. The sooner the better, except for peppers and eggplants. I'm waiting till May 15th on those. We are losing light pretty quickly, so we're gonna go back to the back gardens and take a look at them. After one more gratuitous rose shot, 
The kids' garden is not planted yet. I'll put up a video whenever we decide to plant that. I help them uh, by drawing out their plan this week. Maya is currently building them a little deck area there, and they have a furniture set we're going to set up so they have their area that they can hang out. Here is the high tunnel progress. You guys actually saved us a lot of work by telling us uh, that we should fill the beds, build the beds first and build the high tunnel around the beds, which feels really obvious when you say it, but we had just not considered that. We were just gonna build the high tunnel and then build the beds. And we built three and filled them with a tractor. So thank you, uh, that was a lot easier. However, because of the way that the high tunnel is constructed and the way you have to do like the bottom, we couldn't build the fourth bed. We wouldn't be able to finish building the high tunnel if the bed was in the way. So the last bed is going to have to be built after the construction of the high tunnel and it will have to be filled with a wheelbarrow. Uh, but, but one out of four is a whole lot better than doing all four that way. So we appreciate that feedback. I was talking to Maya today about making a video about building that bed whenever he gets down to it. Uh, kind of showing how we build these beds because this is kind of just a somewhat updated version of the garden beds that are in the front and I love these. This is so much growing space. So much growing space. I just, I just sit here on my sitting stump and think about what I'm gonna plant here. I've got a good handle on it, but staring at this area, knowing how many square feet this is, how much space is it? Is, that bed is 60 foot long. That is a long garden bed. That is a lot of space. And looking at this, imagining the amount of food this is, imagining canning and dehydrating and putting up this food, picking it, pruning it, all of that is, uh, is probably why I'm considering growing roses in the square beds up front because it's, this is just a lot. It's great. It's beautiful, amazing abundance, but abundance can be difficult as well. Uh, just because something is abundant and it is difficult doesn't mean you're not thankful for it. I am so thankful for this, but I'm also like, okay, let's plant some roses. I feel like we're hitting a point of growth with these squash that it's just gonna be like, wow, every time you turn around, uh, they will have grown more and more. You can see I've got baby squash on here. These are just a basic yellow crook neck, um, which, I mean, we'll be eating these in a week. And this whole row, almost down to the end, is summer squash. Right there is the okra row. And this row is largely winter squash. Got lots of germination going on of the stuff that I've sowed more recently. I don't have just a whole lot to say about this area. I think it's still just kind of one of those things is there's a lot of anticipation and we'll see how it goes. However, taking squash out of the equation in the front garden, putting it all back here, is one of the reasons why I'm like, wow, I have a lot of space. Because squash plants are, they're really large. And in the past, I've grown 10 to 12, sometimes up to 15 squash plants. Um, I've grown them throughout the beds, the square beds. I use those for squash the last couple of years. And so not having squash in that garden is, is just kind of like, oh, what do I do with this space? Because uh, this is a lot of squash back here. I saw this thing once that said, you know, check on your friends that are growing zucchinis. We are not okay because, you know, like just the absolute abundance that you get from squash plants. Like this is a lot. It, barring anything going wrong, we'll be well covered. Our squash needs will be met here. I don't need to put any in the front. And let's talk about these potatoes. My goodness. My potatoes were in a video that I did the other day, just very briefly, and I started, the messages started rolling in, um, asking, seriously, what are you doing? Because your potatoes are exploding. I don't really know. I do know that my goats are ridiculous. Listen to them. They saw Maya. He was out front. He's the man with the food. Um, so, potatoes. What we did this year was, it started out, I was trying to do sort of, kind of like a, kind of like a Ruth Stout method, and it ended up not going that way. Uh, basically, what we did is we put cardboard down, we mounded that up with compost from our barns, which had sat out and broken down over the course last year, and 
then we mounded that up and then we took some of our super soil, which is just compost, it's broken down um, wood mulch uh, that we get from a local place. And we put a few inches of that on top, so it was in mounds, we had three mounds. And we planted seed potatoes from Haas Tools, blue Adirondack, French fingerling, and darn it, I can't remember the other one. It was something crescent. It might have been Australian crescent. I'll double check it and I'll put it on the screen. And we put the, the seed potatoes in and, um, and then mulched with straw. And over the course of the next couple weeks, I put straw down and put straw down and put straw down and continued to mulch the new growth. And at some point, I got a little behind on that. The new growth got so big, so I kind of mulched around it, but I didn't cover it. And at some point, it got so big that I was like, I don't know what to do, so I stopped doing anything. And that's where we are now. So these are mounds that have, uh, in some places, you know, a good few inches of mulch that now that's compacted. And the potatoes are just looking amazing. Now my sweet potato slips over here are just starting to perk up. From everything I've t been told, these are just going to take off like weeds at some point and I will have no concerns whatsoever. I've been a little worried, but they are really starting to look lively again, even though they're still very small. All of that is sweet potatoes. And then back here in this little in-ground garden, uh, I'm getting germination. I was very concerned because of the water that we had. We had a ton of rain and I was worried these things got washed away. But as you can see, they're all coming up and they're surprisingly coming up pretty much where I planted them. Uh, even here where you can see the water moved through here and there's a ceiling right in the middle of it. So they stayed put, really happy with that. Like here are some lovely butternut squash seedlings. My pro cut sunflowers back here germinating like crazy. And now that I've got germination going in this bed, I'm gonna go ahead and mulch it with straw. I have an extensive mulch video that I've like outlined and every time I've come out to shoot it it's just been crazy windy and I knew you wouldn't be able to hear me. So I don't want to like go too deeply into that topic but mulching is such a game changer in the garden whether you're doing it in raised beds or in the ground. Keeping your ground covered it, I mean, the, the, it ends the battle against weeds. You still have to pull weeds but they're not so hard in the ground that they break off and the roots still in the ground. So it just makes it a lot easier. And with this bed, um, I waited for the germination to mulch. And you can do that. Like, you can wait and you might have to pull some weeds in the meantime. I just showed you in our front beds, we went ahead and mulched. And what I'll do to plant those beds, if I'm putting in a start, all you have to do is separate the mulch, put the start in the ground and put the mulch back. If you're planting from seeds, what I'll typically do is just move the mulch to the side, put the seeds in the ground. And then once they're germinated and I've done my thinning and all of that and they're getting a little bigger, I'll just close the mulch in around them. And but you can totally do that. Uh, that seems to cause some confusion for people. They just don't know, like, when do I mulch? And that's really just a matter of choice, whether you want to work around it or whether you want to weed while you wait for your seed leaves to get big enough to mulch around. So that's going to be it for us today. As you can see, the sun's getting kind of low. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today on this garden tour. I love getting to share this with you. Garden tours will be going up every Saturday through the season at noon central time. And thank you guys. I bless you. Until next time.